Hi everyone. Welcome to the fourth day of uh, your SPL webinar. We have a small uh, technical area to finish, so I will be taking you through it today. And then uh, we will be moving to the past paper and uh, exam techniques, and then we'll see how to answer. So there's going to be a lot of work, and I hope you have taken a printout of uh, the past paper that is September 2018 exam paper and kept it along with you. And I also hope that you uh, went through it thoroughly so that I can discuss um, without wasting much time uh, reading. All right, uh, managing a strategic change. Uh, so change is something um, that every organization encounters on a daily basis. Changes in different factors, be it uh, employee, organizational processes and systems. So it is something that we have to live with. And when it comes to change, um, we cannot say no. We have to uh, adapt and um, move forward. So if an organization does not embrace or adapt uh, to changing environmental conditions, then uh, it will be difficult for it to survive. It can even lead to demise, like how we looked at it on uh, strategic drift. Meaning when the environment changes, organization also has to keep in line with the changing environmental conditions. Right, a key model uh, when it comes to uh, looking at types of um, change is based on speed of change, how fast it's happening, and uh, the extent of change. So on the x-axis, we have transformation and realignment. Uh, transformation is basically um, changing an organization's culture. So it's a fundamental change. So I hope you would take it down. So transformation is about changing an organization's culture. And, and a fundamental change occurs. So the two key, I mean, two uh, I mean, key words are change in an organization's culture and a fundamental change. And uh, you can't handle this change with the existing paradigm. So there is a massive shift. And that's what transformation is all about. And then we move on to realignment. And uh, this is not a fundamental uh, change. Your central assumptions and beliefs would remain same, but a slight uh, modification. And on the y-axis, you have incremental when it comes to the speed. So incremental, we know, you know it's a step by step approach and also it will take a long period of time. Uh, but the end result is a big difference. So there is a fundamentally a different organization once the incremental stages are completed. And uh, the Big Bang, it is a forced reactive transformation using simultaneous initiatives on many front. And it happens fast, meaning um, in a short uh, space of time. So when we look at the combination, um, if something is incremental and transformation, meaning uh, a fundamental change happening over a period of time, a long period of time, then we call it evolution. You know, a worm becomes a butterfly, doesn't happen overnight, it takes a bit of time. Similarly, you know, theory of evolution, ape to man, so it's, it's over a period of time, you know, but a fundamental change.
So in evolutionary change, an organization will try to change its culture. And uh, it is quite challenging as well because uh, changing culture, it's not easy. And culture would include three elements. Assumption, which is the larger part. Values and the beliefs. So to change assumptions, values and beliefs will take a lot of hard work and time. Also, an evolutionary change when it comes to an organization should be planned. Um, you should know what you want at the end of the 10th year and what you should do every year. It can't be an accident. Of course, you can have 20 to 30% uh, unplanned activity coming in, but 70%, 60 to 70% should be planned. But then we have adaptation, that is, uh, incremental change, but a realignment. And this is normally the most common type of change. It is slow and gradual. And also it is based on the existing culture, process and competence, competencies. <clears throat> so most of the time organizations, what they do is they adapt to changing circumstances. They don't go to change the fundamentals. You are doing accounting manually, but thanks to technology, now we have computers, etc. So you're still doing accounting, but in a technology-based environment. So that is adaptation. And it cannot happen overnight. You need to assess the purchase requirements, do a cost-benefit analysis, identify employees who can uh, do tasks in a technology-based environment, train them. So it's, it's incremental and then realignment, so adaptation. Then we have um, Big Bang realignment, which is known as reconstruction. Uh, it's, it's a quicker change, uh, which is normally brought about by uh, sudden external pressures. Maybe through um, a competitor, innovating something or changing the regulatory environment. Suddenly, you know, the legal structure can change, uh, which can impact your organization. So as a response, the business might uh, launch or, you know, implement many initiatives at the same time rather than approaching, you know, on a, on a gradual basis. So that's what reconstruction is all about. And then we have a revolution. That is a fundamental change, which happens quite fast. So we can say rapid and fundamental change within an organization. Also in uh, a revolutionary change, a period of flux could exist and uh, the organization will face extreme uh, external pressure for change. So that's the key thing, you know, extreme pressure for change. And also culture has to shift pretty fast. And uh, if that does not happen, uh, the change initiative or the intervention will, will fail. Also, a lot of new initiatives uh, will be launched simultaneously um, so that the direction of the organization can be reversed. So this is the most uh, difficult area to operate with. Whereas incremental evolution and adaptation is uh, relatively easy, but then it takes a bit of time.
Right, barriers to change. Uh, there, there can be um, many barriers. But these are some of the usual factors, which are you know categorized under three uh, key headings. One is uh, job factors. You know, fear of technological unemployment. I mean, we don't know what the new technology is. Therefore, you fear that you know company might get rid of you. A fear of changes to working conditions, too much work, etc., and fear of demotion or reduced pay. So job related factors and then a social factors you know dislike need to break up current social environment you know you sometimes you will have to be away and personal dislike of people implementing change you know you don't like the person who is carrying out the change and lack of consultation leading to rejection of change you don't get proper support or knowledge about what is going on then uh, they are for you don't like the change and personal factors uh, implied criticism of current working method and uh, feel less valued and work becomes more monotonous so due to the when there can be many factors apart from this and um, due to those reasons um, employees resist or you know uh, they don't like change but you cannot say no to change as company as an organization and as employees we must um, learn to adapt to change right now this is another model um, that can be used to carry out the change process loins uh, three stage change model and according to loin uh, that successful change is achieved in three stages so first one is unfreezing existing behavior so what happens is in this stage you will talk to your employees and explain them the need for the change as to why the company should carry out this particular change so you are trying to convince them you are trying to break the barriers you are telling them uh, the benefits of change how it is going to impact them positively so this is what the whole unfreezing part is so a lot of motivation has to go in so that they will not resist and they will not be stuck to the old ways of you know doing things so whatever change that you are proposing you tell them the benefits then they will buy if we try to do a change without telling them what's going on then the fear sets in but the moment you communicate in their tone in their language then they'll start um taking it and then the second stage is uh, making the change this is where the actual change occurs and then uh, the new methods are implemented and it is important to note that at this stage you need uh, hands on leadership hands on leadership and good communication are two key important factors that will calm down your employees and also you have to identify the training gaps or knowledge gaps in employees and then provide them accordingly so for example your employee is doing bookkeeping on on manual ways and then you bring in computers and if he has never seen a computer then you need to provide him a lot of training on basics of computers plus the accounting package and so on so that his confidence will be increased and also during that change phase you have to know how to manage the accounting of i mean existing accounting requirements 
So while this guy is being trained, someone else have to do the accounting part. So there's parallel um, work going on. So all that we covered in the area of making the change. And the third <clears throat> stage is rephrasing the new behavior, meaning we have brought in change and now you need to make sure that your employees stick to the new ways and new methods of doing things. If not, they will go back to their old behavior. Right, therefore the new system should become part of the organizational culture. And uh, people, you know, the employees should feel natural. They should not go back to the old ways of doing things. <clears throat> so you need to bring in KPIs for the new system and also attach it to rewards as a motivational element. So the whole idea is they don't fall back on old habits and you know the culture. Also, some argue that um, rephrasing is unnecessary. Yes, rephrasing can become um, unnecessary in a highly dynamic environment, if you if you have to constantly keep on changing, because what happens is uh, when you rephrase, then okay, they are in a new mindset, and again, if another change intervention has to come in quickly, then again you have to unfreeze, make the change, and refreeze. So in a dynamic environment, you keep on changing. So uh, a step by step approach. So that's what uh, Lewin's uh, three-stage change process model is. Then we have uh, different leadership styles that can facilitate change. Um, first one is education and communication. Now here, the belief is that you communicate positively towards your employees and uh, communicate, I mean, educate them, the end result, then they will accept it. That's the belief. You as a leader, you have to make sure that you sufficiently educate your employees and then you communicate positively. And then also another option is facilitation and support. This is where you uh, try to counsel your employees so that uh, they can overcome their fears and anxieties about the change. So you need to identify employees individually and then find out what their fear is and give them the right medicine. It can't be a generic solution to everyone. Third would be uh, cohesion. Sometimes we call it power, but I'll come to that at the end. Four is uh, manipulation. Now here, we don't directly tell them what's going on. So we, we uh, disseminate information in a selective manner. And there can be negatives, but we don't talk about the negatives. We only talk about the positives. So that's basically manipulation. And uh, negotiation. It's a process of, you know, uh, negotiating between two parties and uh, a situation that will lead to compromise and agreement. But as a added point, I would like to tell you that uh, when you are negotiating, you can take two stance. One is a negotiation based on power and a negotiation based on interest. 
A negotiation based on power is about I am the boss, you listen to me. Or my bargaining power is high, therefore you have to give me this. That's uh, power based negotiation. It is not long term, it will not work. If your transaction is one time, it's okay. But if you have to constantly engage with your stakeholder, customer, or supplier, then power based negotiations will not work because the other party will feel intimidated. The interest based negotiation looks at the objectives of each party. What does A want and what does B want? So, so long as you can satisfy the objective, both parties will be happy. So, that's where you have a win win situation. So, especially in your professional life, you must always try strive to achieve a win-win negotiation position that is long term both parties are happy so it's a good deal for both parties right then we have uh, participation this is where you you aim to involve the employees meaning uh, you get their ideas in the change intervention and um, you give them some aut autonomy to design their own jobs and pay structure etc within the limits of course so basically get them to participate you're not just telling them what to do but they're also contributing i mean key objective is motivation right uh question what, what do you think that is i would like to throw that to you Question. There is a question, or could you please give other examples of power-based negotiation? So basically, power-based negotiation happens uh, when, when your bargaining power is high or when you have an authority. Okay, if you are the managing director and you go and tell the production manager, look, I am the managing director, so you listen to me. I mean, uh, you are not taking the opinion of the production manager, so he will be very demotivated. So I'm your boss, listen to me, that kind of an approach. Now you can even look at uh, those in, you know, geopolitical context, certain countries with certain powers, you know, try to rule others. But the point is it's not uh, long lasting. It does not create a win-win situation. Right, so I would like to tell, I. I want you to tell me the meaning of cohesion. What does that mean? So this is normally taken as the last option. I mean, you have tried, now if you see, there are six leadership styles. You have tried the five and nothing works, but then this is your last option, cohesion. That is where you use your power. Right, so it's like a compulsory approach. So you tell your employees, look, either you be part of this change or you leave the company. So it's more bureaucratic and um, comes from more formal authority. And you will also try to make your position stronger by bringing in legislative support wherever possible. So that the employees have no other way but to listen to you. So as you understand, this is not a, you know, 
uh, win-win situation. So like I said, it should be your last option if none of the others work. One question, out of these six styles, which is the most uh, appropriate method of style for change? What is the best way to go about? What do you think is the most uh, best option? Well, I can see some answers, but it actually depends on the situation. And um, normally, except uh, coercion and manipulation, <clears throat> you can pretty much equally look at the other four options. But mostly, it depends on the situation, the context. Is power negotiation like the autocratic leader? Yes, correct. That's an easy way of looking at it. Could you please explain rephrasing? That's um, making sure that new ways of doing things are continued. You put in place you know, measures to make sure that new ways of doing things are continued. Evolution is over a period of time and adaptation. Uh, you adapt to new things, which can happen quickly or slowly. Coercion is uh, using power. That is a compulsory approach by management to implement change. That's what coercion is. All right, contextual features. Now, this is um, <clears throat> a model that is uh, used to help managers design an approach towards change. So what it says is there are eight factors that you need to look at uh, when, when a change has to occur. I would like you to take down what these, uh, I mean, what each of these factors mean. Uh, when we say time, it means that uh, whether the organization has sufficient time to change or should they change now, meaning react quickly. I mean, if you say react, it's immediate. Whereas respond, you can take time and do what needs to be done. So in contextual features in time, what we look at is how much time the company has or the organization has to carry out the change. <clears throat> Now or later. Scope means uh, how much of the organization will be affected. Right, so is it a realignment or transformation? That's what scope is. Are we changing only the production and marketing or are we changing the entire organization? Scope, you know, area of impact or operation. Preservation, basically what to keep and what not to keep. What to keep and what not to keep. Meaning, uh, you know, which aspects of your working culture, competences and people you should retain when you change and which ones you should let go. So when you bring in the new accounting system, 
to your accounting department and if you had 10 employees doing manual work now probably you know you will not need six of them so you preserve four let the six go of course with a, a satisfactory redundancy payment so that's what preservation means And uh, diversity, it's about uh, you understanding that different departments uh, would have different subcultures. Now, see, when you carry out a change initiative, you can't have one recipe for everyone. It's, it's very difficult. I mean, you know, most of you who work in companies, you know, uh, the setup of an accounting function and the marketing function. The accounting department, if you walk in, it will be very quiet. People are busy. Everyone is glued on to their um, computers, thinking a lot. And, uh, and then you walk into the marketing department. Oh, a lot of flamboyance, noise, chit chats going on. So different subcultures within uh, the you know main organizational culture. So that's what diversity is all about. So when you when you carry out a change, you must understand that and uh, go, go about accordingly. So it can't be one recipe. And you go to R and D department again, more serious work research so each department will have a different culture and right, then capability these are basically the resources uh, that is available to invest in the change process uh, that you are planning whether the company have sufficient resources and when we say resources there are four types financial physical human and intangible resources financial physical human and intangible resources so intangible resources are your information and trademarks and brand value etc so that's basically uh, so resources are capacity Capability is basically whether you have the ability to exist to cope with the change. Capability. Whether the company or the manager is capable of coping with the change. A small organization will not be able to take up certain changes that happens in the external environment. So that means they are not capable, while a large organization will be able to uh, cope. So especially during economic um, decline or recession, large organization will, you know, hold on. But small organizations will go out of business. Readiness whether your staff are aware of the need for change and are they ready you know whether they are committed that's what readiness looks at if your staff are ready for change that's a very good sign meaning a lot of other limitations or barriers can be overcome basically willingness of your staff for change And finally, power, uh, how much authority and autonomy the change agents have to carry out the change. So change agents um, will have the power to do change within the organization. And if so, how much?
a few questions uh, what is the difference between proactive and reactive reactive actions are you 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 implement or carry out something once something has happened variance analysis is reactive proactive is more like forecast you you foresee before something happens and then you put certain measures in place that is proactive can scope be realignment or transformational yes and diversity is about uh, subcultures okay and uh, four types of resources one is financial resource that is your financial uh, you know resources mean uh, debt and equity money that you have in your business return profits uh, return earnings etc then your physical resource building machineries equipment all that then human resources your people skills competencies they have and then finally intangible resources uh, your information and then your brand name logo all that those are your intangible resources <clears throat> right the last model known as the puppet model basically this looks at um, certain factors that a company must look at to carry out change successfully basically you you look at these aspects if you want a successful change and uh, you look at these factors to manage change within any uh, business system so the puppet stands for people organization process and information technology so when it comes to people it's about them having the right skills and motivation to carry out the task the new change intervention and uh, organization is about you know being organized job roles lines of command communication organized organizational structure uh, which should support the strategy and um, the whole formation of the business which is organization and then process the systems you know they must be well defined efficient or documented so that everyone have access to and understood by people who work so that what process is all about and finally it you know which links the whole organization and which drives performance you know which helps to drive performance and it will you know replace manual tasks and then uh, improve organizational efficiency so what you must understand here is uh, when you try to implement a change in one of the areas others will also get affected so it's all interlinked so the success of a change will depend on all four of these factors so coordination should happen among all four so that would be the key word coordination among all four yeah so with regards to uh, puppet model it and people so people is about um, what kind of skills competencies they should have when you, when you carry out a change and also the amount of motivation that you need to provide the rewards and their resistance level 
and what you need to you know overcome their resistance and uh, it is about the amount of support you need to provide investment on it training to what extent it is impacting the change and the changes in processes and you know staff development that will occur due to you know the changing it and to what extent it should be exploited uh, to derive business benefits that's what uh, we look under the it category information technology okay there is a good question that's uh, can we analyze failure of change management through popit yes you can look at the success or failure of uh, change uh, through these four aspects you can even use the contextual features the eight factors right so that uh, brings us to the end of uh, the technical content um i have provided you with this sbl revision notes which is very useful uh, there, there is no, not a lot of content there so since we are running short of time for the exam um it's it's a you know good uh, material to revise so i hope you would make a good use of it <laughs> right if you can open this question uh, processes and business structure i would like to take you through it quickly i would give you about 3 minutes to quickly have a read on it
All right, uh, so let me read the question to you. The business architecture committee has been asked to make recommendations on the sourcing of activities. That is whether you must do it in-house or outsource. The BS has also been asked to identify technological implications or opportunities for the activities that they recommend should remain in-house. Suggest and justify recommendation to the BAC for each of the following major process areas. One is attendance of repair uh, staff at breakdowns, membership renewals, vehicle insurance services, membership queries, and vehicle uh, history checks. And they have given you information with regards to each of these individually as well. And then the B part looks at analyze the advantages that 3C will gain from the decision to outsource the purchase and maintenance of their own vehicles. Basically positives of outsourcing option. Right now to answer the A part, which is about um, what the business should do with regards to uh, these areas, whether they should do it in-house or outsourced. Now, it's, it's a generic question, right, in terms of whether you have to do it by yourself or give it to someone else. So when a question is uh, I mean, uh, for a similar type of question, you can use a model like this, which is, you know, Harman's process strategy matrix. This is something that I already took you through. So let's look at it one by one. So the first uh, item of uh, attendance at breakdowns for repairs where would you place or which quadrant will you choose so in, in answering this question you must say uh, where the company should be placed and your reasoning So you must say the level of strategic importance of that particular activity. If you say high, you must say give reasons. And similarly, complexity. How complex the activity is. If you say low, you must give the reason. And then accordingly, where would you put it? So I would like to throw the questions to you. So the first uh, process of uh, you know, activity of attending at breakdowns. See, it's important that you uh, understand the business when you have to answer questions like this. That's where the business awareness or the acumen becomes uh, very important in SBL.
I mean, only a person who has gone through a surgery will know how painful it is. So work experience is very important and very relevant when it comes to this examination. So if any of you are not working, uh, it's important that you do a lot of reading about companies and how they operate, etc. And watch uh, business programs and um, read business magazines to understand how these businesses operate. So strategic importance of uh, this particular activity is high. Right, and uh, some breakdowns, they are very simple. And um, some are quite tricky. So strategic importance is high. And therefore you have to keep it in house. You can't let someone else handle it. And overall complexity is also high. Because your employees need to be knowledgeable of course, the breakdown can be simple, but your employees should know what to do. Depending on how they diagnose, they will know whether it is an easy job or a difficult job. So knowledgeable workers, you know, skilled employees are a need. And therefore, you must place it here, you know, work on improving and keep it in house. Also, you must uh, harness your IT to seek improvements in the response time to breakdowns. So that your engineers can get to the point faster. Also, you must have uh, systems in place so that your engineers can diagnose issues faster and um, they can provide the right solutions. Technology will keep on developing. So whatever new uh, things that comes into the market, you you know maybe keep it on a um, internal you know database. So your employees can you know access and update their knowledge. All right, number two, uh, membership renewal. What do you think about the strategic importance and the complexity? And accordingly, where can we place this? Membership renewal. Remember, in answering these questions, you must justify your answer. For example, if you say outsource, you must say why. And that why, I mean, um, that outsource should be supported by high and low complexity and importance and with reasoning.
membership renewal. So renewal of membership is important for your continued business. It's easy to retain your existing customers than going after new customers. So complexity is low, uh, but the strategic importance is high. Like I said, you know, your revenue. And therefore, it works here. Automate this process. So how you would write is um, you automate the process. That is, for example, when a member's expiry date reaches, you send a automatic email telling him, okay, in, in, in a month's time or in two months time, your membership will expire and it's time to renew. And you also incentivize if required. And in a month's time, you send another mail. And if the deadline is tomorrow, okay, you send a mail today. And if you don't get a response to all three of those mails, then you must check the system to see whether he actually got a mail, a reminder mail. Because sometimes there can be errors in automation as well. So you put a system in place and of course you need to see whether it works properly. And um, they also can opt not to renew. If so, you know, there is a way for them to communicate. So this particular process, you know, falls into the automate category. But the third one would be um, vehicle insurance services. Where do you think we should place it? Complexity with uh, vehicle insurance is normally high. It's, it's technically complex and it also carries uh, large risks and uh, regulatory requirements. And the other problem is these regulatory requirements will constantly change. So, I mean, which makes the complexity even more higher. But then the strategic importance is low to 3C. They are not in insurance business. Therefore, the best option for them is to outsource this service to a specialist. I mean, who's good at doing? insurance service, service. And if they are to do it by themselves, then it will be very expensive for them to manage that, you know, entire department, recruiting people. So give it to someone else, give it to the specialist to handle. And then um, you, you can focus on your co-activities, which is of course an advantage of outsourcing
Next would be uh, membership queries. How would you uh, place it in terms of importance and complexity? So strategic importance when it comes to membership. Strategic importance of membership is high. I mean, you must, it's, it's your customers. You must have more and more membership coming in. So you must have frontliners or staff who are well conversant and who can handle these um, queries for new membership plus the renewals. Also complexity is high because of the type of questions they ask. Uh, you have different you know, customers. So therefore the complexity is also high. So we would place it in the improve quadrant. So you have to invest in people and uh, in systems. For speedy service and to respond quickly and accurately to multiple or wide range of questions that uh, you know new members can ask. So it should be an in-house function and uh, the physical location of the call center or the people who handle membership queries can be in a place where it is economical for you to operate. So this is how you gain more marks by writing more points. So it's in the improve quadrant. Next would be a vehicle uh, history checks. What do you think of the strategic importance? Strategic importance. <clears throat> uh, you can argue both ways, either high or as low. But see, um, it is important that you provide accurate data here. So the complexity can be high because um, you know the kind of uh, damage through accidents, uh, stolen vehicles, finance agreements, and you know these kind of factors can make it really complex when you do the vehicle history check. And uh, how important, I mean, the, the importance of these factors is very high for the, you know, customer. <clears throat> so, 
So the best option for 3C is to outsource it. So, you know, give it to someone who is already in this field for them to do it. So you will place it in the outsource quadrant. Yeah, someone asked, why is it low strategic importance? Because it's not your core business. All right, moving on to the B part. That is, uh, analyze the advantages that 3C will gain from the decision to outsource the purchase and maintenance of their own vehicles. Could you keep, uh, quickly give me the advantages of outsourcing the purchase and maintenance? Right, so the advantages uh, that the business will derive from outsourcing, their purchasing and maintenance of their own vehicle. Um, so first of all, it is um, low in strategic importance and high in complexity. low in importance and high in complexity. And that's the reason why we are outsourcing it. So you must identify the tangible and intangible benefits of this option. So first benefit is um, 
economies of scale. So basically, you know, auto direct. They purchase thousands of cars and vans for their customers. So therefore, you know, bulk discount leading to, you know, economies of scale, which they can pass to their customers. Then another benefit is uh, predictable costs. See the vehicle lease payment with auto director monthly. And also they include uh, full maintenance of the car, including tires, etc. So 3C is in a position to predict uh, these costs for budgeting purposes. Because uh, previously the costs have been variable and unpredictable. So now, these costs will be predictable and then it will help them in their budgeting. So your finance or numbers can be planned acute, pretty much accurately. Another key advantage would be reduced overhead costs in uh, garage and purchasing. Also, you can um, realize some income from the sale of the garage site. And the case says that um, the site is in a residential area with no room for expansion and severe parking congestion. So you can sell this particular area for residential development and realize some money because someone else is doing this work for you now. So that's another huge advantage. Another advantage would be um, it will free up some cash for other investments from purchase to lease. See, when you go to buy on your own, uh, you need considerable amount of money and money that is tied up in fast depreciating assets. So if you switch to uh, the option of leasing, it will release uh, a lot of money for you to invest elsewhere in the company. Another advantage would be uh, the you know moving away from the bottleneck which is your central garage at the moment you drive or transport to this garage from all parts of the country and you leave it there while they are serviced or repaired and then you drive it back to the operational area and if you look at auto direct um, they have their repair and servicing centers throughout the country So it will be possible for vehicles to be taken locally for services and repairs. So this will also reduce your downtime. And that's another key advantage. Another object, I mean, advantage would be <clears throat> concentration on co business. See, the management of garage is not a co requirement or a co strategic requirement here. So, senior management time will be, you know, wasted. So, if you outsource, 
uh, it frees up time so that they can focus on you know uh, core business activity that will be directly relevant to customer and you know the business as a whole Also, another advantage would be that um, see, uh, you 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 have the ability to derive or get expertise from your you know outsource party. See, vehicles <clears throat> they become increasingly subject to legislation design <clears throat> designed to reduce carbon emissions. Also, the technical complexity of vehicles increase. So, this would make it more difficult for the company to uh, maintain without specialist monitoring and, you know, uh, repair equipments and knowledge. So, if 3C is to do it by themselves, then they need a lot of investment in this area. So, the best option for them is to outsource to a specialist. And therefore, now AutoDirect will have to monitor legislation and also advise on uh, the implications and implement uh, the requirement for its larger customer base. So, in simple terms, you are passing the headache to someone else, and then you focus on your core business. Right, so I would like to um, mention something important here. <clears throat> if you look at this question, let me take the B part just to explain this point. Um, analyze the advantages. So it's 10 marks. A common question in your head is how much do we write for this? How much do I write? for a 10 mark question. How do you decide that? I would like to throw that question to you. How do you decide how much to write? You know the amount of marks that are given. So in, in a simple question like this, you know, advantages of outsourcing, 10 marks. How do you decide? very important that you understand this um, for various reasons time management gaining of marks sufficient explanations Someone says three advantages and three disadvantages. No, that is out because it question only asks about the advantages. So how would you go about? You must be really clear with regards to this particular element. For a 10 mark question, how much do we write? Would five points be sufficient? Or should we write 10 points? And uh, your paragraphs, each paragraph, how many lines? You no, know, these are confusions that you have. Okay, a lot of you say five advantages or five points, five advantages with explanation. How much of explanation?
Right, listen carefully. It, it's, this is a simple question, right? There are various types of questions. And now after the break, I will start doing the mock paper, I mean, uh, September 18 paper, then I'll explain it to you, different forms. But for now, understand, here to get the 10 marks, you can write 10 points. That is one way to approach it. So like uh, how I discussed before, uh, benefits of economies of scale. So you explain it in about two lines, then you get a mark. Predictable cost. Right now, 3C can predict uh, what the costs will be in future. Therefore, they can plan it out. Overheads will be reduced because no need for garage and, you know, etc. cetera. Um, higher vehicle availability because the garage is a you know, bottleneck. Now you're avoiding it. Therefore, higher vehicle availability. Um, freeing up cash for the investments or the use. So now what we are doing here is, you know, one by one we are going on, point by point. So that is one way, 10 marks meaning 10 points. Each point you can, you know, explain it in about two or three lines, depending on the type of point. If not, there is another approach. That is where you mention the point, you explain the point, and then you support it with further explanation. We call it the development mark. For example, uh, take the point of um, purchasing benefits from economies of scale. That is this auto direct purchase thousands of cars and vans for their customers each year. So therefore they can negotiate substantial discounts from manufacturers and this can be passed to their customers, meaning to 3C. So when they buy large quantity, they have what? Economies of scale. That is one point. The whole of this is one point. So that benefit comes to you. Your cost will reduce. Economies of scale. How do we develop? So that is one point, you get one mark. Now, how do I develop to get another mark? Anyone who wants to give it a try? How do you develop the point of economies of scale? Okay, that we gain by saying when auto direct buys a large quantity, cost per unit reduces, so that benefit comes to us. So our cost will reduce. How can I develop further to get another mark? So this is what writing five points and developing it to another five points to get the other five mark. So five points will give you five marks. Five development points will give you another five marks. <clears throat> How do you do that? To the point of economies of scale. How can I develop further? Or how can you develop further? Very good. One uh, answer, it would also make us cost leaders in the industry. Yes. So if you are pursuing a cost leadership strategy um, and this particular option of um, <clears throat> outsourcing will help you in your value chain to reduce cost further. So then, you know, you can pursue that cost leadership. So that's a development. So another way to argue is when your cost is reduced, your profits will increase, meaning towards shareholder wealth or your ROI will increase. <clears throat> your denominator remains constant and your numerator increases profits. So this is how you develop. <clears throat> Right. There is an, another good observation with regard to answering 10 points. Can this be done by when they say analyze? When they say analyze, they require explanation, isn't it? Yes. Analysis means um, looking at from three I mean a 360 angle. So for example, coming back to this economies of scale point, 
how is economies of scale because auto direct purchase thousands of cars i mean a lot of cars and vans for their customers each year and when they buy a lot they are able to negotiate a bulk discount a substantial discount and when they get discount they can pass to their customers so this is what we are looking at it from many different angles so all this is but one point that's what analysis is all about you don't just say okay outsourcing will give me economies of scale no how in what angle so that's where the analysis comes in but that's a good observation so even analysis um, you know needs explanation from many different angles another good point uh, also when costs are reduced due to efficiency can help to create barriers to entry for the yeah others to come in yes agreed <clears throat> so remember depending on the marks it's about number of points a 10 mark question you can write 10 points or you can write five points and write further five development points which will give you the other five marks so if the question is easy you can you should focus on writing more points so if if the question ask i mean if if there are 10 marks you try to write about 12 points but keep a tab on the time you know that you don't exceed the time so even if few points are here and there you have more points to cover and you know give you marks all right now well, let's uh, take a break but then uh, in this break time i would like you to be very thorough with the september 18 uh, scenario hope you have already read through the exhibits if not i would like you to quickly have a read on it and then i will see you exactly in uh, 15 minutes
All right, welcome back. There are two questions that I would like to quickly answer. One is, uh, can we state it in bullet points or paras? No, no bullet points. You have to uh, state it in paragraphs. The only time you will write bullet points is when the question asks you to uh, provide the answers in slide format. I will show you how to do that. Um, other than that, uh, everything should be in paragraphs. Also, please clarify whether we have to explain when writing 10 points. Yes, you need to clarify. Um, no, uh, whether we have to explain. Yes, you need to explain. For example, um, the previous points of uh, economies of scale uh, advantage how you would write it is you can say for example auto direct purchase um, thousands of cars and vans for their customers each year they should be able to negotiate substantial discounts uh, from manufacturers or sellers as they buy in bulk. So some of these discounts can be passed on to their customers, such as 3C. And these discounts that is being passed on would go on to reduce the cost, input cost of 3C. So that whole thing is one point. So that's how you explain. And the same point can be further developed to gain another mark. And how would we do that? We could say the reduced input cost will go on to reduce the overall cost of 3C. And this will help in improving profits, the bottom line. Hence, helping to achieve the objective of maximizing shareholder value. And this would also make the company more competitive in the marketplace. That is one way of developing. If not, you can say reduced input cost will reduce cost of production or you know your unit cost will be lower in value chain you can look at it as uh, inbound logistics plus procurement so when your input cost can be reduced and if your strategy is cost leadership then you this will help you to pursue a cost leadership strategy but that point you will write if there is any mention of cost leadership strategy in the scenario. So don't go outside the scope. You must stay within the scope. So your development points should be within the scope. Don't go outside. Right now, let's move to the important part. That is um,
September 2018 paper. I will tell you how to approach the whole examination. So please make a, make no own make your own notes so that later also you can you know have a read. I mean, as you listen, you can't grasp everything. So make sure that you take down your own notes. All right, so the usuals for is including reading, planning, and reflective time. Four hours meaning 240 minutes. Of this 240 minutes, the recommended reading time is 40 minutes. So that's the first thing you must note down. Meaning, from these 240 minutes, you can spend a maximum of 40 minutes to read. You can't be you know, reading again and again a particular paragraph to understand and then write the answer because then you are wasting time. Keep the 200 minutes to write answers and 40 minutes to read. So like I said on the first day, reading and understanding is a skill. You cannot um, learn it overnight. So it needs a lot of practice. So try it out with a lot of questions and a lot of uh, case scenarios. So 40 minutes, reading and understanding time. And this question paper is an integrated case study with one section containing a total of 100 marks and all tasks must be completed. So there are multiple tasks with uh, different amount of marks. And all tasks contain professional skills marks, which are included in the marks shown above. Meaning, of these 100 marks, 80 is for technical content, 20 is for professional skills. And there are five professional skills. Right, so every case study, I mean, SBL case study will have an introduction page. This will tell you what the company is and few basic information. And it will also give you uh, information on exhibits. Now, if you look at this um, case study, there are six exhibits. You know, you can look at it as an appendix or appendix or an attachment, whatever. So a bit of information about a company and uh, six attachments. And so there is a question uh, that says most of the videos say to write a plan in your answer booklet. Should we do it? Yes, you must do it, and I will tell you how to do it. You know, they say failing to plan is planning to fail. So you must have a plan before you attack the answer. Right, so we must, in the 40 minutes, first 40 minutes, um, firstly, quickly read the requirements. See, the, it says the case requirements are as follows, and you will be told which role you are taking in each task. Right, so sometimes there's a different task, I mean, a different role in each task, but in most cases, you will be given a single role throughout the entire uh, paper, meaning, you know, for all tasks. Right, so we have one task here, and that has two subsections, that is one A and B, totaling 32 marks. So for your first task, you can see there are six professional skills marks and 18 plus eight, 26 technical um, marks for technical skills. So 26 plus six, 32. 
So we have one, two, three, and four. So there are four tasks totaling 100 marks. So each task will have a small paragraph giving you some further information and then you know moving on to the requirement. So the first thing you would do is have a quick read on the requirements. So you read the requirements or the tasks and then you read the exhibits. So we have the exhibit one extract from the most recent annual report of CC. Extract meaning part of it from your from from the company's annual report. So we have chief executive statement. So you can get a feel of the company, you know, when based on what the CEO uh, says. I'm not going to read any of this. I hope you have already done it, but I will be discussing as we. Uh, discuss the task uh, for you know with regards to each of the tasks. Also, extracts from a risk report section of the annual report. Then we have specific risks and what they have done about it. Press release. See, information is given to you in uh, different forms. S some apart from the annual report, you have a press release of the announcement of the new road in B. And then we have uh, forecast revenues and costs for the construction of the new road uh, the project, cost and uh, revenue. So financial data is given. And outline contents of uh, the PID, project initiation document and a summary of the operational issues section of the PID. So some information there. And number five, exhibit five, transcript of an emergency meeting at the company's head office following protest against construction of the new road. Conversation between people. And the sixth exhibit, a report of an interview with uh, BV in uh, O Daily News uh, newspaper. So that uh, interview is about big data. Right, so once you read the tasks or the requirements and then the exhibits, then you can start answering. So in that, um, if, if you are to answer the first requirement, so the first thing you do is you identify which exhibit this particular requirement or task relates to. All right, now see, analyzes. Okay, prepare the, the task one. Required, prepare a briefing paper for the board meeting. So can someone tell me what the format of this briefing paper is? So on the handouts, you see um, SBL effective communication. That document contains all the different formats in which you are supposed to answer.
See page number five, briefing notes, briefing papers and working notes. I will just take you through one, others you must read and understand on your own. See, briefing notes or briefing papers are working notes and working notes. As the name indicates, um, these are intended to be short and to the point. These are intended to be short and to the point. but have no real formal structure as they are intended as advisory documents for other people such as senior managers or board directors to help them communicate more formally both verbally or in writing to a selected audience. Therefore, there is no recognized formal structure, but students must understand that these differ from reports in that they do not require opinions, conclusions, recommendations, etc. Instead, they should be merely informative and factual in order to, for the recipient to form an objective opinion of the facts presented. So it is very important that you understand what these different formats are. So you, you, you read it, allocate some time and and read and understand what these different formats are all about. So going back read and understand how to write letters, emails and memos, reports, presentations, slides and notes. So go through in detail. So this is a very useful uh, document. So I hope you will make good use of it. All right. Going back, so this is the first thing you will underline when you read the task, prepare a briefing paper. So there's no formal structure, So, but you will have headings and then uh, write answer. So the requirement is analyzes the financial and non-financial issues, which will affect the final decision of whether to accept the contract to build the road in B. Note a recommendation is not required, so don't go to do that. In, in examination, it's very important to follow instructions. Don't do things that the examiner um, tell you not to do. Professional skills marks are available for demonstrating analysis skills in identifying information which is relevant to the decision. So you will underline the briefing paper. You will underline analysis skills analyzes that's the verb financial and non-financial issues so 18 marks we need to talk about two things so you can break it between financial and non-financial nine nine points for financial and nine points for non-financial and our container is analysis meaning we are going to have a 360 view look at it from many different angles So financial and non-financial factors for, I mean, factors that will affect the final decision, but then don't go to write a recommendation, whether to you know, take it up or not. No, that's not our job here. We are just going to analyze financial and non-financial factors. Now, this question, 1A, gives you 22 marks. Can you tell me how many minutes will you spend on this? 
the number of minutes you are going to spend on this question you must write it here next to the question i hope you can see my uh, mouse pointer tell me how many minutes will you spend on this particular um, question that is 1a How many minutes? Someone says 1.8 minutes per mark. That is if you are doing a three hour paper, that is 180 minutes divided by 100 marks. See, that's why SBL becomes very easy here because you have a lot of time. Listen carefully. <clears throat> We have four hours, that means uh, 240 minutes. From 240 minutes, I told you to take 40 minutes for reading. So that leaves you with 200 minutes for writing. And of course, planning as well. So 200 minutes to get answer this question now uh, 200 minutes to get 100 marks or 80 marks two hundred minutes to get hundred marks or eighty marks So 200 minutes to get 80 marks because the balance 20 marks is the container like I told you. It's the way you write it. You're not writing additional content there for that 20 marks. It's the way you write your answer for which you get 20 marks. So SBL, actually you have a lot of time provided you are you know, prepared in your skill of uh, planning and uh, writing, you know, a little faster. So we have 200 minutes divided by 80, you get 2.5. So for a um, 22-mark question into 22, So you can spend about 55 minutes. <clears throat> so the time that is allowed, you can write it here so that you can keep a tab. So if you start at say 10 o'clock, so from that time and the time that you have written is allowed for you to answer this particular part. So you should do that for all the you know tasks.
All right. So in answering this question, we must have a plan. So how do we structure that? Analyzes the financial and non-financial issues which will affect the final decision of whether to accept the contract to build the road in B. So we underline the words briefing paper, the, the, the key part of the question, financial and non-financial issues and the skill that is required analysis. Next thing you need to do is attach the exhibit that is relevant for this particular uh, task. You should know now for some questions, all exhibits will be relevant. Something like pestle analysis or SWOT analysis or five forces. Then it is difficult to at attach a particular exhibit to you know the task or the requirement. But in most cases, you can directly derive the information required for the task from a particular exhibit. So then we can come and write that here so that it, you know, that you should do once you have read the requirement and when you are reading the exhibits. Because then you will know, okay, I read this requirement and this is the exhibit that is relating here. So you come and quickly write it here. That's what I told you at the beginning. As you read, you should understand where it relates. So the first thing you do is read the requirement and then you start reading the exhibits. So when you have read the exhibit, I mean, when you have read the requirement and when you are reading the exhibits, you should know which exhibit relates to which task. Right, so now tell me for this 1A, which exhibit or exhibits you will use to answer. There is a question, uh, isn't it 2.5 minutes per mark? Yes, correct. It is 2.5 minutes per mark, which means it is 45 minutes for 18 marks. Yes, correct. Since we allocate time only for technical marks and not professional marks, yes, you are right. So an 18 mark question will should be answered within 45 minutes. Correct, you are right.
So this particular requirement, uh, key exhibits are, I would say, uh, two and three. But there is a few information that you can get from exhibit one. CEO's concern about uh, being economic uh, friendly. Trying to make more money. And investments on systems. And how a system can, you know, support a large project. And so on. So that's what I said. Some exhibit, I mean, some some requirements. It's difficult for you to attach it to only a particular appendix or an exhibit. So be mindful of uh, that fact. You know, generic questions will have answers or will have information for your answer. For you know, on the entire case, but there sometimes there can be specific uh, requirements which will directly relate to a particular exhibit. Right, so now it's about uh, having a plan for your answer. Don't spend a lot of time in planning um, because you, you need to save time to write. So your plan should be a sketch, you know, in, 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 in very sh short form. So for example, plan for 1A, you will say financial, you say, you know, financial aspects. Don't try to write in full words. Why we put up in short is so that you will remember later as to what you should write. So financial aspects. Then leave some room and then we'll say non-financial aspects. So financial aspects, what you will write about. For example, If you look at this uh, project, this road construction project, on exhibit three, it shows progress payments from B's government is 21 billion. Figures are in million, therefore it's 21 billion. And the project cost is 19 billion. So you have a profit of 2 billion. Whether this is in line with your current ROI. Now that is a financial aspects. Right, so you can write about a right point on profitability. So this is how we plan. Then you know, in, in the scenario, they talk a lot about uh, protecting the environment. Now that becomes under non-financial. Protecting environment. Also, if you read the exhibit two, that is where most of your information is, right? They're trying to reduce journey time by half, almost half. So that is again a non-financial element. So their journey time, half. So later when you come back to write, you, ha you have some indication as to what you're going to write. Then you, they say, um, low price will be an important criterion when choosing the contractor. Uh, so that's a financial element that we need to be careful of, low price. So if they are expecting a low price, can we bid at that price to, you know, make sufficient return for our shareholder? So similarly, what the, the point that I'm trying to make is, you, you write down, you know, in short, what you will write later. So this is how you plan. Financial aspects, non-financial aspects. So can you quickly tell me for this question, can you give me five each? Five financial aspects and five non-financial aspects. First, let's go with the financial aspects.
you must always try to stay within the case scenario meaning within the scope don't try to go out meaning don't assume and bring in points those are allowed provided you are within the scope assumptions within the scope are allowed not outside and um, one thing that i would like to uh, highlight is on the first page see in the introduction c construction is a listed construction company no as you read certain things should come into your head something like when you read it as a listed construction company you should know the implications of a listed company okay there are external shareholders there is majority shareholders minority shareholders the company will have a pe ratio company will have an overall i mean industry pe and company pe there is share price share price movements right there is dividends so every all aspects related to a listed company should automatically come to your head because later you will need it if the company is not listed okay a lot of things are not needed so a listed company you know board composition how should that be right okay you are not going to take all this down but as you read it should you know uh, come into your head see the board of cc comprises 50% executive and 50% independent non executive so it's perfectly all right so board composition is good if the balance is um, different and if there are any questions related to that in cg or the leadership then you know how to tackle that so that is why the knowledge of uh, technical content is also important All right now can you tell me five financial points right so key financial issues will be the profit margin so forecast profit is uh, 2 billion with a revenue of 21 billion so you can achieve a margin of 9.5% and currently your target is 8% so based only on number this uh, project is above your expectation 
Another, I mean, uh, financial uh, point would be the working capital requirement. For this particular company, they haven't carried out such a large uh, project in the past. So forecasting will be difficult and then, you know, the, the, the amount of working capital required will be quite high. Then the liquidity of the project and the uh, you know sufficiency of short-term bank facilities. See uh, if the time duration is not according to the plan, then the funding needs will also differ. Then whether you know company has sufficient sources to support the continuity will become a question. And another issue is what if the progress payments uh, get delayed? Normally any government contracts, there can be delays. So if that happens, it will put a lot of stress on uh, CC's uh, cash flow requirement. Can minimum return required by shareholder be a financial indicator? Yes, of course, it is a financial indicator. Also your uh, debt requirements. See if uh, the company breaches the covenants laid down by current lenders, then they will not be able to go for more loans because that's another source of you know finance. So if the current setup, they will uh, be looking to refinance some current debt. And if they have already, you know, huge um, commitments, then refinancing will become tough, meaning, you know, problematic. And for shareholders, uh, this will provide a good opportunity to enhance long term value. because um, they can look at uh, follow-on projects like maintenance work, etc. And project Alfia or A was, you know, it, it was a loss. So there is, you know, a bit of doubt whether a company can, you know, achieve the targets set in this project. Basically, you know, come up with reliable forecast and uh, achieve that. Especially because this project is over mountainous terrain. And CC does not have experience in handling uh, such territories. See, your sensitivity is uh, quite high. 
currently your margin is 9.5% and your expected is 8%. So only 1.5% different, which is uh, 320 million. Yeah, there is a good question. Uh, it is, do we just explain these indicators and why they are important, even though we have no figures to calculate with? Yes, correct. See, all financial aspects sometimes will not have numbers for you to uh, further explain. So even without numbers, you can talk about it. For example, I said uh, it is good for shareholders in the long term because they will get more business in terms of maintenance, etc. So we don't have data to support that claim, but that claim can be made provided this project goes uh, well and uh, the payment from that particular government comes in. And if, if both parties are happy and the chance of that government giving more business to this company is high. And provided they are profitable, then shareholder value will increase. Right, moving on to non financials. If you can quickly give me five points to write under non financials. Non financials can be quantitative as well as qualitative factors. But it can't be monetary related. That's what it means. What would be non financial factors that we must analyze with regards to this particular project? Right, so one uh, factor is uh, they are going to get involved in a new country and they're going to deal with uh, new suppliers, labor, basically new stakeholders. So whether they can put up with the cultural differences. So that is a non-financial factor. Another non-financial factor is the expertise in handling a different environment. Previously, they have done projects in flat countries. 
while um, the new project is in the mountainous terrain. So whether they can handle such an environment is a question. Another non-financial factor would be uh, central management resources, whether they have sufficient resources to, uh, you know, oversee the project effectively. Now, if you look at the audit committee, uh, they, they, they are currently, you know, they have responsibilities. And if you bring them here, then they'll be stretched too far. So workload, then whether they can do an effective job is a question. Another non-financial factor would be the system support. Currently, they lack an operational system to support a project of this size and location. So it is double of what they did previously, right? 10 billion to 21 billion. And their site smart development is planned for the next two years. So there will be disruption while this is happening. So one thing is either they should have delayed this project till they develop the system or they have to look at the possibility of buying a system to support this project. So then it is a cost factor and then you know you can talk about it on the financial aspect. If so, how much can they be spending on such a system? And also look at cost benefit analysis. Right, there is a question. Cultural issues and experiencing and handling mountainous terrain. So by explaining that part with regard to the new supplies and labor and not doing mountain projects. Do we get one mark for both points or more needed to get the mark? Talk about cultural issues separately. Cultural issues about people uh, from two different countries. So that will get you one mark. No experience in handling mountainous terrain is another point altogether. Talk about it separately, then you get another mark. It's very important that you write one point in one paragraph. Don't go and talk about two points in one paragraph. And between each paragraph, leave at least two lines. So then the marker can easily identify. Uh, if you go and write everything into one paragraph, it is, you know, difficult to read plus, you know, you are not separating points. One point in one paragraph and between two paragraphs, leave at least two lines. So moving on, other non-financials would be uh, bringing in more suppliers to make sure that there is no, uh, you know, hindrance or delays for the supply. And uh, you will need to recruit manpower. And that will take more time. Also, um, you are working on a very tight schedule, meaning you will 
have to bring more labor or still labor, meaning cost of project will increase. Then if whether you can achieve the target return. Also, they may be over optimistic. See, uh, in some areas, it's not possible for you to construct new stretches of road. You know, that will give them uh, shorter journey times than the current road network. So his, uh, you know, that particular country's president. Rather, Minister of Transport. So they are trying to reduce the, you know, time by almost half. So whether this is actually achievable is a question, especially when this particular company, you know, does not have experience in uh, handling such a project. They will not know unless and until they do it. And that is a key project deliverable, right? You know, trying to reduce the time by almost half. Right, moving on to the second part. Discuss the difficulties CC may face in fulfilling the criteria stated by DO, the Transport Minister of B. So what are the issues that CC may face or the problems they may face in fulfilling the criteria stated by DO, the Transport Minister of B. Professional skills marks are available for demonstrating business awareness, commercial acumen. So for this requirement, most of the difficulties can be identified through the exhibit two. Because that is where the minister mentions uh, what they would like to have. So since it's an eight mark question, you can write four points and develop it to another four. Can you quickly give me four points?
Right now, see, um, from the press release, The top line says a 20 billion new road scheme between G and L will transform the economy of B region, cutting the average journey time through the I mountains by ha almost half. So that's the first thing, project objective. Project objective. CC does not have expertise previous expertise in handling such a project, whether they will be firstly able to meet this objective in, in such environmental condition, you know, mountainous terrain. So project expertise, you know, previous prior experience is an issue for CC. Because if they don't meet that, some part of revenue also will not come in, future projects will also be lost. And uh, the, this particular project will put a lot of strain on their existing work as well. So that's how you develop. There is an answer, so I would like to read this question to explain a point. C discusses the difficulties CC may face in fulfilling the criteria stated by DO. So that's your scope. You must work within this scope. I have an answer here that says flooding might be a problem during the construction, which could cause a delay in the work. Um, it's a little away from the scope. So don't go out. So you must stay within this criteria. So that's what I started with, you know, the objective of the project. Object, objective of the project is to reduce journey time by almost half. And uh, CC does not have expertise in handling such environment. So can you meet this objective? So that's your first issue, difficulty. Hope you understood that point. That's very important. Stay within the scope. Right then, one, two, three, fourth paragraph. It says low price will be an important criterion when choosing the contractor. So if you are to set a low price, then your cost needs to be low. Meaning your margins will be low. Then the next question is whether you can achieve your target 8%. Because any cost increase can uh, eat your margin and therefore CC's objectives will not be met. Right, because um, the, you know, customer is looking for a low price. So that is another difficulty CC would face in fulfilling the criteria. Then they say, we shall also want the contractor to carry out the work efficiently. Underline the word efficiently. Efficiency is a subjective term. See, it's about output, input-output ratio, productivity. Um, then you have to have KPIs to measure efficiency. Efficiency from CC's point of view and efficiency from uh, Desmond's point of view. How do you reconcile? 
So there can be conflicts there. And they are also talking about timetable being as short as possible. So if you want the timetable to be short as possible, you must bring in more resources. And that's going to increase your cost. Again, going back, whether we can meet our financial targets. So business acumen, you bring in business knowledge. If you want to reduce time, you have to bring in more resources, meaning you have to spend more money. Meaning we need to jeopardize cost control. Also, while you work on this project, you are causing a lot of um, disruption to, you know, nearby areas. Also disruption to natural habitats. And he, he noted that in his, you know, statement. We shall expect our chosen contractor to limit its environment footprint so whether you know cc can minimize that that can be a separate point Then he also says uh, the government will guarantee any debt finance that the contractor needs to fund the project. At what cost? And whether any covenants will be needed. And uh, if part of the work is not satisfactory, whether they will keep up to the promise. And if they don't, how will that impact the continuity of the project? Because 19 billion, they need to fund. And if the part payments, you know, in, in those stages don't come in, that will become a huge issue for CC. Also, um, in the construction, there are many other aspects. Like, uh, you know, supporting features such as drainage and bridges, etc. Now, they will look at how well these are also constructed. So, that is where this whole efficiency and, you know, scope document, all that comes into play. And how will, uh, you know, D DO look at this? And whether CC can, you know, satisfactorily meet those uh, requirements. Right, so the key point is, more than the answer, I would like you to understand how to, you know, structure and, you know, derive the method in which you answer. <clears throat> so if you look at this exhibit, most of the points for your answer can be derived from the exhibit itself. 
you should not underwrite or overwrite. And eight marks, you, you must limit it to the time that is allowed for that. So any minute that you take more from here will eat time from the other side. All right, so I'll uh, wrap it up from here. And from, I mean, tomorrow we will uh, continue with the balance of the tasks. And uh, a few more uh, techniques that I must uh, mention, I will uh, take it on tomorrow. So have a good night. See you. Thank you very much.